Addiction Podcast, a podcast where we go one-on-one with fiction creators, such as authors, filmmakers, actors, songwriters, and more. Each episode, we get the inside scoop on our guests' creative process, the ups and downs of their industries, and our guests also give out tips and tricks that help them become successful. And now, let's jump into the episode with your host, Chris C.L. Lowry. All right, all right, all right. My next guest is the author of eight novels in over 40 plus short story publications. She is a member of SFWA, which is Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Her science fiction novels have been named as a Carl Brandon Society Parallax Awards recommended title, Fresh Voices in Science Fiction finalists, Dream Realm award finalist in science fiction, and epi finalist in science fiction. Her short works have appeared in numerous places, which includes Bane Straight Out of Tombstone, Bram Stoker, Bram Stoker, finalist in horror, Sycorax's Daughters, and White Wolf's Vampire, the Masquerade Anthology. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicole Givens kurtz Nicole, what is going on? Hi, everyone. <laughs> um <laughs> writing and reading and trying to stay safe in this very challenging like like world we're living in i want to say it's dystopian but you know right. we're not quite there yet but we're teetering right. on the edge of becoming oh, like we're, we're, we're almost there, <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> now, now, speaking of this year the coronavirus pandemic the racial injustice that's still going on around the country this goofy presidential race that's going on and the loss of so many iconic figures, obviously Chadwick Boseman, one of them, Mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant, another. Where are you at mentally with everything going on in 2020? I mean, it's a struggle. I'm not even going to like sugarcoat it at all. Um, I have to take breaks um, in terms of like, I have to, I have a, a garden that I started. I call it my COVID gardening. Um, and so I go when I it really, I post when I post on social media, it's like hashtag COVID gardening. Um, <laughs> so I've been really kind of like trying to find um, um, a bit gardening. So I've been like getting back outside in nature and spending time with my plants and just trying to, I, I've been writing um, too. And I've been writing a lot more, non-fiction pieces like blog pieces like this is where i this is how i feel this is where i am um right just to kind of alleviate the build-up right mm. i don't mind there are days where i just sit in my bedroom crying and i sleep for 14 hours like it happens like i just i crack you know because i'm a person and it's just right. so much to shoulder i'm a mother to three boys um i call them boys but two of them are 19. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. 16. Okay. And so, <laughs> right. So we have already had our, the talk with them when they were younger and up through when they were driving. Um, but now that they're out in the world at college and, you know, driving around and just trying to be men, it's incredibly frightening. Um, oh, imagine. So lots of conversations with my boys, like, you know, just trying to, and then of course there's like this whole issue of, of a pandemic. So my interactions with them are kind of limited because um, they're in large groups. They're at a college, they're at work at McDonald's or whatever it is they're doing. They're not, you know, they're interacting with the public a lot more than I am. And so (laughs) it's like (laughs) all the things, um, but that's what I do to kind of just stay centered. My mother uh, and I have really great conversations. We talk about the things that we can invoke or change or, you know, what we have is a blessing. And then we, we spend a lot of talking about the things that are working or things that we do have, um, like the versus, you know, going down the rabbit hole, the very, very long <laughs> what is wrong right. in 2020? Right, so, right, right. right. Positive, um, it's been time just thanking, thanking God and being, and being appreciative of what we do have. Like, I do have a freezer with food. I do have, you know, 
a roof over my head versus some people who right. don't have money for rent right now, who don't have, like all the people mm-hmm. who are sitting in line for food banks. Like that's not my reality right now, right now, thankfully. And so I, I try to spend my time focusing on those things versus because the other stuff was snowball and it, when it does, like I said, I'm, I'm crying and I'm sleeping for 14, 20 hours. So. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Now, now, now going back to the talk, cause I want to, I want, I want to discuss that a little bit with you because you are a parent of three young men in, mm-hmm. in today's society. And the talk has been brought up a lot recently. Um, the most recent mm-hmm. when doc rivers, um, he made his uh, post game conference. Um, I saw that. Mm-hmm. He mentioned the talk, and people are automatically, which they always do with the athletes and anybody in the sports uh, profession, talk about, "Oh, he's a millionaire. What is he talking about?" But people really don't understand when black people talk about the talk that they have to have with their children, and it's and it not even. Matter, our- yeah, it doesn't matter your economic level either. Like it exactly. just doesn't. It's, it doesn't. <laughs> I remember that time Chris Rock got pulled over. Um, oh, it was right after Ferguson, and he'd right. gotten pulled over, and he like turned on like his phone and was recording it. This is Chris Rock. Right. <laughs> it right. makes exactly. no difference. It makes no difference. It makes um, no difference. But your socioeconomic level doesn't matter. Right, and and like, how does that? I, I'm going to ask two parts to this. As a parent, mm-hmm. how is that? Because it's normal to us when it shouldn't be, um, in a sense. Because most most other people, their talk with their children is the birds and the bees. That's their biggest concern. And ours is keeping our children alive yeah. every night, every single night. So how how was that having that talk when you really, after you had it and you just realized the talk you had to have with your, with your, with your, I guess your oldest was the first mm-hmm. one. Um, mm-hmm. how, how, and then, and then from 19 to even the 16 year old, how much of a difference mm-hmm. things were like, they weren't getting better <laughs> now for the 16 year old for his talk. They've, they've gotten worse. So how, how was that as a parent actually when you digressed after having to talk and mentally had to think about what you just did? So we had the talk uh, many, many times since the boys were like, like six or seven. Um, we, mm-hmm. you know, you have the talk is not, and I don't, I don't think I'm alone in this. The talk is not a one-time thing. It's okay. Oh, we're going into the store. Here's the talk about how you behave in the store. Make sure you don't put things in your pocket. Make sure you walk. Like I walk with my hand. If I get something in my hand, I don't have a buggy. I walk with my hands out at a forty-five degree angle. Um, so we had to talk about don't touch things for this reason. They might think you're stealing it, you know? Uh, so we have the talk happened many, many times. Okay. We're going into a restaurant. Here's how we behave in a restaurant, but it's more than just sit down in your seat and don't throw food for there's that. There's the extra burden or requirement rather that you have to behave within these tighter parameters because we don't want them calling the police on us in this restaurant. Right. Right. And so um, the boys had, all of them had the talk uh, many, many times, but I remember when my oldest son got a job and he was going to start working. I cried. Like I sat down in his room and bawled like a baby because I knew that he was no longer within my protective arms, right? He's out there in the world. I'm not at work with him for eight hours. He's interacting right. with people. What if somebody walks up to the cookout and decides this is the night we're going to rob it? You know, my right. son is in there. And so it was just, it. And so we had the talk. It was nerve wracking. It was hard. And I looked at my mother and I was like, how do you do this? How did you do this? And she was like, you know, you know, Nikki, this is what you, you know, you tell them, you give them the best guidance you can. And then you pray over them and you let God handle it. And I'm like, I can't, I just, I don't know how to do that. She's like, what else are you going to do? You can't go with them. 
but it's still it turns i mean it's a, it's a struggle it's a real emotional struggle to have them out there and not be able to protect them when and the only guidance i can give them is words or words that just seems woefully inadequate um and so um and and you know one of my sons goes to north carolina a and t which is an hbcu okay. Oh, um, yeah. He's a naggy. <laughs> and, um, he was like marching and protesting, and I was worried sick because I was like, "Who are you with? <laughs> you know, right? You know, you know right. where are you at? <laughs> um, how do you get home? Do you guys have a rendezvous spot? If you get split up, like all these things." Um, and I, I, I try not to show that to them. Like I try to spend a lot of time just being that the voice of reason, right? Okay, do you have a? Do you have water for your eyes? Do you have gloves? Do you have your mask? Like I'm trying to be super logical and super like organized because where if you guys get split up, where are you going to meet at? Do you have your phone? Is it right. charged? Da, 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 and all these things. Um, but inside, I am completely wrecked. Mm. So, proud of him for you know, you know, being a part of the movement, but terrified. Yeah, I'm going to get him home in a box. Right. In so many different ways. You know what yeah. I mean? Yes. Like you got, you had, you do have anarchists out there. You do have the police out there. You just don't know what mm -hmm. is going to happen. You, and you watch some of these uh, protests and it's like, what is going on? It's like a, it's like a war zone. You know it, what I mean? It so very it, much it, it, I can imagine. I can't imagine. I really can't imagine. And now, um, speaking about the talk, to me, it seems it seemed at one point it was like a talk you just need to really focus on having with young men. But now it's one you have to have with young women as well, because they seem to be targets as well. Obviously, with Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. Tatiana Jefferson, Sandra mm -hmm. Bland, those names. And we have the Say Her Name and Say Their Name movement. Yep. So how... How do you feel about that movement? Because th this has been the issue when um, they, always, they, they always talk about this of the black woman is the most disrespected person in America. You know what I mean? This is nothing yep. new. So how do you feel about this issue coming to light? And obviously the WNBA is doing such an amazing job. Yes. Um, yes. Going, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, my goodness. <laughs> I think they're at the forefront. I think the WNBA is top and the NBA is under mm -hmm. them. You know what I mean? I agree um, with that how statement. Do you feel about this coming to light. So I got the talk <laughs> when I was younger. Mm. Um, I had the talk, my which is probably why the boys got it so early because I got it early. Um, I was raised in a housing project um, in Tennessee, and so when we went out side the projects and do other things, and the city itself is predominantly white, um, we left those areas and went to areas where there were a few people who looked like me, um, we got several talks about how to behave. Um, and my father and I, and my, and my mom would give me the talk all the time. Um, and just, this is how these folks gonna be, this is how I need us to be. Um, but my father recently, did, he and I had a long conversation about respectability politics, right? The, my, and I had to tell him, you know, my son, acquiescing to everything the police officer asks does not guarantee that he will not hurt him. Right. And so I think that that's uh, a gap between like my parents' generation and ours um, because there was a, well, if you're just this way, nothing will happen to you, right? Or it's, right. it's likely. That isn't true. Um, isn't. And so I, not anymore. And I don't know if it ever was, honestly. Um, and so we had a long conversation about that, about that talk, but it's definitely something that I got as a, as a young girl. Um, and I think, I think women get that talk, but it comes with a caveat, right? With additional, with additional bullet points rather, you know, because we're women, you have to protect yourself from, you know, you know, sexual assault. So you have your keys in your oh, hand, you don't unlock your door. Like it's, it's, it's a continuation of that talk. And if you get pulled over by police, this is how you act. This is what you do. 
Mm. And so it's a, it was part of that that smorgasbord of conversations. So I I think that women have always, if you look at um, video videos from the 1960s civil rights movement, women were at the forefront of that as well, and they were getting dogs yes, and, were. And, all, and and it was the same type of violence against women, and many women were also like lynched and assassinated and harmed, right? And so it isn't new. Um, right. We're just now getting to the point where we are vocal about saying their names. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. And, and now this pandemic, I always, I always ask authors because so, so many of us have different paths. So many of us um, hustle in a sense, a different way. You, oh my gosh, when I went to your website and saw the, the appearances you've had, um, we're talking about, you've been panelists. Mm -hmm. Every, literally every year you're doing something. You've been at these um, these cons, you've been um, a writing, publishing, children literature panelists. Mm -hmm. Dystopia fiction writing panelists, self published yeah, panelists, actually, yeah. North Carolina, Colorado, everywhere. So, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So, my question to you is with the pandemic and everything shutting down, how has that affected you in a sense of um, these cons, these festivals, mm -hmm. these fairs that you can't attend because they either postpone, they're going virtual, or they just right. um, cancel? So um, I run uh, a publishing company, uh, Mocha Memoirs Press, which is a small press that amplifies marginalized voices and speculative fiction. And so one of the things that the pandemic did with the cancellation of a lot of the conventions was it took a, it took like a huge chunk out of our um, out of our like resources in terms of uh, hand selling books face to face. Right. And so we partic I participate in panels online. Um, so if you got my newsletter, you'd see like I link <laughs> I link the, the panels that I do online for various conventions. But it's definitely like decreased opportunities to like meet fans or meet readers or meet people who like the same fandom that you do, uh, because the virtual meetings are usually recorded and then uploaded. So you the interaction you would get from oh my gosh, this is an awesome T-shirt. I where'd you get that Cowboy Bebop T-shirt? Those things don't happen. <laughs> And so, right. <laughs> so those things, those are the things I miss about, about, like those are things that have been like sucked out of fandom, I think, um, with the pandemic. Don't get that opportunity to meet other people who share. If you don't already know them, right? You don't get to meet additional people that love what you love or enjoy what you enjoy. So that, that's been, that's been hard. I miss that. That's what I really miss about like getting, going to cons and meeting people. And, and and hopefully one one day I'm hoping next year <laughs> so, well, right. <laughs> we, we we tame this virus and we, we're able to get back to that. But there are also some authors who who either don't or haven't um, done a festival or participated either being a vendor or a panelist at an expo, um, a con, or a festival. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to them how important it is? for an author career to to be out there and be in those public events, um, okay. meeting new readers. That and the networking has been, I, I have, the networking has been great. So um, hmm. and it, it really depends on the convention, but I cannot, t well, there's one convention, but many conventions, the networking, networking is really fantastic. So if I go, I'm really introverted. I don't know if you can tell that, but I'm really introverted. And so convention. Oh, <laughs> I also taught school for 18 years. So, um, but <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, um, conventions are beneficial because you got to network with people. So you get to meet, uh, if the convention is large enough, you get to meet agents, you get to meet other small press publishers, you get to meet, uh, editors were, and I, there have been many times that I've been on a panel and after the panel, one of the panelists would say, Hey, Nicole, I'm working on this anthology of XYZ. You want, you want in? 
right? You know, you were talking about your story, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that sounds like a good fit for what I'm doing. And yeah, give me your card and I'll send the story to you. And if, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But uh, and that has happened on many occasions. Uh, wow. people will be in the audience and they'll find me after the panel and be like, hey, I saw you and you were talking about weird westerns and I also have a weird western and I'm thinking about doing this and I'm thinking, and okay, and so it, <laughs> it, that alone um, is worth the price of admission. And that uh. doesn't even get to the point where you get to like geek out with other people that like what you like. Um if you get to do, and I don't know if Milton Davis will do this again, but if you get to do a predominantly black con, like Black Tasticon, which is what um, the state of black science fiction in Atlanta about three years ago during the week of Juneteenth, it was it was like a homecoming. Um, because in many really? instances, when you go to conventions, you do not see very many um, people of color or black people. Um, so this convention and I think it was 2018 um, was that was the point it was all Afrofuturism all black science fiction all black fantasy spec uh, comics it was fantastic it was wow. black folks everywhere uh, black art um, black plays and you know it was just music that were all speculative. And so uh, that was really awesome. And that's kind of one of those unique experiences that you, like, it was so phenomenal. It was it was like going to see Black Panther before Black Panther came out. Like it was just, mm. it was such a homecoming. Um, and people have been begging them. They did it for, they did it um, every other year, but the last couple of years, they were supposed to do it last year, but didn't for, they were all, the organizers were involved in other projects. And so I would really love, and but I, I understand that putting together an event like that is, is takes like a year in advance planning, and it's really exhausting um, because I have been a part of convention uh, committees before, and it takes a lot of work. Um, but that was one of those things that was really affirming, and and I just loved it. Um, but even the conventions that I go to, um, if I go to them often, like every year, then those those many of the people there become like my found family right and so wow. yeah it's like hey i saw you last year and you had readers who are like oh do you have a new book out this year i bought blah 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 last year and you know it's it's that it's worth the price of admission if you can do it um yeah. which is kind of why I like virtual the virtual stuff too because if you can't get to conventions because of travel and cost um you get to have some of that flavor with the virtual conventions. Mm. But I also know that um, the Carl Brandon Society uh, hosts the Con or Bust, which is like a fund that they help pe people of color and get to conventions. So they, so like one of the things. Oh, really? Kinda, yeah. It's called Con or Bust, B U S T. Um, and I think the Carl Brand, I know the Carl Brandon Society used to fund, she used to like fund that or get donations for that. And so that's another, they have, like, I was in Ireland for Worldcon, and there were many, three or four people who were there who were, had utilized funds donated to them from um, Con or Bust. So they were able to attend a Worldcon just so they can offer people of color to be in those spaces. Because, again, because it's something that doesn't always happen. Right. That's amazing. So let's go to the beginning of your journey. When did your writing journey begin? So I've been writing since I was like three or four in my head. Right. So I would I was a notorious uh, non-sleeper had insomnia when I was like five or six, just could not sleep. So whatever the last thing I was watching on television, I would extend it in my mind and so if that story was wow. bugs bunny and elmer fudd then it would continue on they would have other adventures until i fell asleep if i fell asleep right um but actual pay for writing that happened when i was in high school um i won like a regional essay contest and i got like money for it and i was like whoa you can get money for that? <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> what? I mean, I knew I was a big like Stephen King reader, so I was a very I read a lot. My um, mom will probably tell you who to ask her. We spent a lot of time at the library. Um, I actually went upstairs to the adult section when I was twelve, which was unheard of at the time. <laughs> like, like, yes. exhausted, like my A section, and the lady, the librarian, and the children's section was like, just take her upstairs. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so many times were when when I was younger, my friends would be at the mall, and I would be at the library on Saturday. I would just spend hours in the library, like reading books, going into sections, reading magazines. Just the library was like my place. Um, and I would spend a ton of time there and I, and I wouldn't realize it, right? I'd look at my watch, like, oh crap, mom's going to be home by this time. And I, you know, I'm still at the library. Um, but to answer your question, right. It was like, it was like 10th grade. I got like a hundred bucks and I was like, whoa, I can get paid for this. And then I won a poetry contest that same year by a regional ladies club. And it was really funny because it was one of those, um, tea clubs and it was like elderly ladies and they were all in their little tea hats. And it was one of those um, tea clubs. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss an episode of the Fiction Addiction Podcast by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Now, back to the show. Okay, so and so it was like there were it was a sea of obedies and my poem that won the selection was about unwanted teenage pregnancy. And so I'm at the, I am the only person of color in this entire room. Like even my teacher escort was, you know, and I'm reading this poem and man, it was, I mean, it was great because like I got paid to do it, but um, those were the two instances, the high school essay contest and the poetry contest where I actually earned money was like, wait, I can earn money for this. And so very excited. Um, and so then I started entering like short story contests and working on my craft. And then I went to college um, for English. Um, and then from there, just continued to, you know, submit things, work on my craft, submit things, you know. That's kind of how my career is about 20. I think I had my first novel. Yeah. In 1998, um, I had a small press except my novel for publication. And that was my very first like book contract. And that was uh, 28, 20 years ago now. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. I've had a long career. <laughs> <laughs> no, so how was how was that moment when you received that first contract? Exciting. Um you kind of sit there, you look at it and you go, really? They, it's, there's some disbelief, at least it was for me, like they actually want to publish this? <laughs> this novel, <laughs> something that I wrote. Are you serious? Right. Um, and so that, that stunned, um, kind of, and I still get those, like even after, you know, eight novels and a bunch of short stories, um, it's still, huh? You actually want to pay me to, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that moment um, gets repeated. So, but the first time, you just kind of sit there in stunned disbelief, and then you tell everybody, um, and it doesn't. They're like, yeah, okay, whatever, because all you have is the contract, right? You don't actually have the physical book yet. Um, so <laughs> right. they're they're just right. like, okay, <laughs> Nikki's running around with a sheet of paper, okay. Oh, and it was paper in those days because it was 98. Yeah, I was about to say. Um, <laughs> it was literally a, you know, self-addressed stamped envelope. And yes, so the whole nine months. So. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now, what was the moment like when you actually had your first novel, that first physical book in your hand? It was weird. Um, only because like, the it was my name and I know I knew that I wrote it um but when I went back to like read the first couple of pages it didn't seem like it was mine really? um there's some surrealness around like I know I wrote it that's uh, that's why I'm with all my books I, I go back and read past it's like oh wow I wrote right. that <laughs> so right, and again right. it's one of those things where you're like you can't see the forest for the trees right you're so busy you know 
dealing with the trees that you actually can't see the beauty of the forest until you take a step back. Mm. And so in many instances um, with my work, it's particularly is when I step back and look at it after, and I don't always reread my work. A lot of times I get the book proof copy. I look to make sure that it's formatted right. I scan a few areas and I, shove, I put it on the shelf. So, cause I, just, I don't reread my work um, often, but when I do, like if I have a series and I have to go back and reread um, because I foolishly didn't create a, a universe Bible, um, <laughs> <laughs> which has happened. So now Nicole always has like a, a universe Bible lesson learned. Um, really? Yeah, you read. Yeah, I, uh, my Sybil Lewis series, the cyberpunk uh, futuristic noir one, did not have a, I had uh, bullet points in a Word document. <laughs> so <laughs> as that series in that world grew, um, I had more bullet points and bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> and additional word documents to the point where I absolutely did not like world building. I hated it. It was one of those things. I actually wrote a blog post about this, about how I fell in love with world building again and uh, world building because at the initial series with Sybil Lewis, the Sybil Lewis series, which is my like, like I said, it's like a kind of futuristic noir, I think Blade Runner with a black female lead in DC. Um, after the fall of the United States. Um, she's also, she's kind of like Shaft, but a woman. Because like, it's one of the things that Sybil does is she, she people come to her and they hire her uh, to take on cases and jobs that the regulators, aka the cops, don't do or won't do. And so she ends up um, working those types of cases. So, um, but that, from that world, Sybil Lewis's world of a, of a United States that's in pieces. Now, mind you, I wrote this in like 2002, uh, where the United States falls into a bunch of different territories um, and governors become, um, depending on the territory, you might have a governor, you might have a dictator, you might have right. you know, a, a committee. It just depends on what territory you happen to be living in. Uh, so what style of government you get. Um, but Sybil lives in the district, which is D.C., um, and not not including the areas that are suburb, just just D.C. proper, which is very not not very big. And they have a governor, and they have, but they've annexed some places too, so that the district is actually bigger than um, our current D.C. because they've annexed places and and right, and so. Um, but from that series to my latest one that came out last month which is my Kingdom of Avis series. It's, um, it's, uh, I actually have like a very flushed um, and full one note with videos and art and music and links oh, wow. to research. And it's um, like, like the difference, it like it took me 22 years, right? But for the difference between, <laughs> between them, um, it's huge. And so world building as it is, and I, I did a talk about this not too long ago, um, but yeah, so the world building pieces I have learned to love when I was able to make it more uh, vivid. So there's no, there are bullet points, but not many. There are charts, there are, there are other things, right? Um, in my new world Bible for the Kingdom of Avis. So um, that was, it's kind of like for budding authors. If you, even if you think it might never be a series, uh, Start a world Bible, because what you may end up doing is writing short stories in that world. Even if you never write another novel in that world, you might write short stories in that world. You might write songs in that world, uh, especially if it's fantastic um, it's fantasy, right? Or you might just side, right? It, it, that's a place or that's a that's a fun place to because you do. Every time you write something new, you build a world. And so if you yeah. take those things and, you know, put them in a OneNote or an Evernote or um, so if you use Scribbler, you just find a place to where you can organize those things. If you decide later on, you want to come back and play that world because you've invested time in it and whatever you can do that. And that was um, took me a long time to learn that. <laughs> much longer than it should have. <laughs> much, much, much longer, longer than it should have. <laughs> it should have. Now, what what attracted you to the science fiction and fantasy genres? Oh my gosh, this is a perfect question because today is Star Trek Day. Um, so, 
And I actually wrote a blog post about it today, too. Um, I used to watch TV with my father on Saturday nights. And it was at first it was an opportunity for me to stay up late. Um, because they were <laughs> Star Trek the next generation. Star Trek the original series was in uh, reruns, right? And this is like the middle seventies, late early eighties. And so I would stay up with my father. He would let me stay up to watch Star Trek. But he wouldn't let me stay up to watch what he called garbage TV, like night tracks or whatever. But he would let or MTV. But he would let me stay up to watch Star Trek with him. And so I had a, a gazillion questions. And of course, that became our time. Where I mean. And it would roll over into Sunday because Sunday was also our time. My daddy would lay. He would always get up early and go get the paper, the Sunday paper. He would come back and he would lay on the floor and he would open up the paper and then he'd pass me the funnies and I would lay beside him. We would both read paper laying on the floor. And that became um, a daddy daughter thing. And so Star Trek was kind of our thing, too. And so uh, <laughs> and I had a million questions, but then I saw Lieutenant Yohora. and I was like, oh, my gosh, dad, there's a black woman and she's not a maid. She's not a prostitute. She's not. Um, a mammy, she's not, you know, she's not, you know, you know, a kick-ass black woman in the sense that she's like Pam Greer. She's just, she's part of this ensemble and she's right. an equal part, of, you know, no one's the captain, but she's an equal part to a certain degree of that ensemble on the bridge. And she's out in space exploring stuff and, and speaking to other aliens and communicating. And so for me, Every scene she was in, I would watch with intensity. Now, I liked all of TOS, um, the original series, but the scenes that she was in, I remember being young and being seen. Right. So, and so for me, that fueled other jaunts to reading your stuff. Right. I was already reading Stephen King a lot. Um, but in Stephen King wrote Eyes of the Dragon, which is part of his uh, the Dark Tower series universe, but it's it's about a king and a um you know, his advisor and a prince and and, and so I didn't I mean I knew I'd read King Arthur fables, but this one was horrific because it's King. And it was also it was it was fantasy horror and I loved it. Just that mashup of genres. And so again, I, that led me to the Dark Tower, and then when the Dark, and so I read like all things speculative that I can get my hands on. Didn't like all of it because hard sci-fi was like, okay, this is boring. I feel like I'm reading my biology textbook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm reading Dune, and I and I know the movie's coming out, but I was reading Dune, I think in like tenth grade, and I just skipped a whole bunch of pages. Um, but in sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher, and it's and I was I'm she it's like a it's a hood school right i mean it's 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 definitely what you were seeing lean on me like kids everywhere graffiti everywhere it was a mess um and i was in sixth grade and my sixth grade english teacher read us um a wrinkle in time really out loud yes and it was again you have a young female protagonist which uh, saving the saving her dad saving the universe like that just didn't happen and so for me i was like i need to read more of those and, and it just took me further and further down the path of speculative fiction because in in that area in spec you can be a woman and do xyz in spec you can be anything you literally you can be anything you want you can be a shape-shifting tiger mm -hmm. right so you can do right. <laughs> whatever you want. So it always confuses me and frustrates me when people complain that Star Trek is now is too political. I'm like, do you? Yeah. Mm. Did you not watch the original series? Right. Because Roddenberry, that was the whole point of the show, was to embed social ills in and talk about them in a way that was non-confrontational. And so I, I think people miss that. So when people complain about, oh, what do you mean there's a gay couple on? They're just shoving in an agenda. Have you watched Star Trek before? <laughs> like, <Right>. seriously? <laughs> that is pretty much all they do. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> in, in, in every, every incarnation, every every version of Star Trek stretches 
like that mythos to encompass what are the current societal ills. Right. And so if you look back at like I was my blog post today talks about how, you know, the Star Trek The Next Generation is, is super nineties. It's very emo. There's a whole lot of black, there's a whole lot of, you know, people with unhappy faces. Like it's just it's a very different trek. And it's very much launched in the nineties where, you know, Heathers <laughs> was big and the crow was big and everyone was so emo and exploring their negative side. Look at the, if you look at Star Trek, the next generation as a whole, there's a lot of that about feelings and like they have a counselor on the bridge. If you look back at the original series, no one cared about your feelings. Um, so <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> they just didn't, right? They just, there was no counselor on the bridge. Um, right. So, I, <laughs> so that's my rant today on Nicole Gibbons Curse.net is how TNG is a uh, 90s love child. Um, but so that, <laughs> all of all of that, all of those incorp, all those things makes me stay in fandom. Um, mm. but it was the idea that is kind of the what if that, that keeps me writing, right? Speculative fiction. What if this was the case? Like, right. what if um I had a I had a detective that was a hawk. And what if her abilities, she's a person, she's a human being, but she has hawk-like abilities by magic, right? That she can see the unseen. And um, which is, which end up becoming Kingdom, like Kill Three Birds, which is my Kingdom of Avis novella. And so mm-hmm. Prentice gets to investigate supernatural activity throughout the Kingdom of Avis. But Everyone's a bird. Everyone has bird-like qualities. They they are divided up based on the type of birds they are. And um, so it's what if, right? That gift that she has, this ability to see the unseen, cost her, right? So she can see things using her hawk abilities, but every time she uses those abilities, it's harder to get her human eyesight back. And eventually she'll go blind. And so and she knows this. Mm. And so uh, I, <laughs> so that whole series, like it's a series. Um, the second book, I'm about three chapters shy of completing. But yeah, so uh, that's what keeps me writing in speculative fiction is the what if. What if what this? If? What if that? And you can do that a lot more easily in like horror and fantasy and science fiction than you can do in like read. Re- real fiction or urban fiction. Right. Now for you, what usually comes first when you create a a story, the world or the character? So um it used to be the character. Um and it still pretty much is, but with Kingdom of Avis it was the world first. Um I had a hawk and I had Prentice's name, but the rest of her got filled out after I filled out the world. I need to know how it works mm. before I could give her duties. I need to know how things, the order, before I could give her a, like, a really, I need to know how she was going to behave in situations in order to do that. I need to know what the world, like, how do the police work? How does this work? How does that work? Because she needs to move in right. those circles. And so you can't do that without knowing the world. And so, yeah, definitely for Kingdom of Avis, it was um the world building first but that's not always the case sometimes it's the character with Sybil it was the character and I just built the world around her okay now give me your top five favorite books of all time top five. Oh, you don't like top me five. um you're making it so hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not even funny. Um, so my my favorite book of all all time is Where the Wild Things Are. Um, my second favorite book is um, The Dark Tower, The Drawing of the Three. Um, that's a series, but the third book is my favorite. Um, maybe this is this is the second book. Um, we All Live in a Castle by Shirley Jackson is also one of my favorites. Um, it's a shorter book, but it's very, um, it's very rooted in horror. 
So those are probably my top three favorite books today. Because it'll, <laughs> it'll change. It'll the change. Tower, it always changes. Right. So the Dark Tower is always on there. Always, always, always. Um, but um, And Where the Wild Things Are is also... Again, that's like my first fantasy book, right? What does Max do? He gets in his boat, he goes to a new world, and he goes over there and he becomes ruler of all the wild things. And roars his terrible roar and shows his terrible claws. Um, and he gets to be something other, right? Something, what if I could leave my room? And what if I traveled? And what if I became king of all the wild things? Because my mom said I was a wild thing. It, it's my first fantasy book, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, so it's one of my favorites. Now, because you have so many years in this industry, in your opinion, how has the evolution of publishing been from 20 years ago to now? It's definitely much easier for anyone to publish their work. Um because of the platforms like um, Draft Digital, you know, Barnes and Noble's Nook Press, um, mm-hmm. Amazon's KPD, uh, KDP, like there, there, it's so much easier for if Bob writes a story today and says I want to publish this, he can go publish it. Um, and so that that in the like that used to be a lot harder. You used to have to actually get you know the gatekeepers to like your stuff and work your way through. And traditional publishing still works that way. Um, but self-publishing has kind of shed some of its stigma. Not all of it. There are still some people who won't buy your work if they find out or think that it's self-published. Um, but that stigma has kind of eroded, right? And so with with Bigo, and, and that's thanks to things like um, The Martian, which was originally self-published, and other works that were originally self-published that hit the New York Times bestseller list or were adapted into movies or TV shows. So people are starting to be like, okay, so the the amount of available text that people can purchase and publish and, and enjoy um, is definitely more than it was 20 years ago when I started in '98 with my first book. You know, an e-reader was like a a desktop printer; it was huge. <laughs> so no one was using those, right? It was it was this tremendous right. piece of it. It was hard. Um, and it was heavy and it was, you know, it was like a, an 80s cell phone. It was just, you know, unwieldy. So um, now that, that they've managed to get them to be very, so you can read it on your cell phone, right? If you have the Amazon app, right? You can read books on your phone. And so I think that um, that level of accessibility to, and Amazon helped with that, that accessibility to um, get works that aren't always published by traditional houses to, also fuels that self-publishing small press industry. And I think people are more open to reading different works. Like, I don't care that it didn't come from Tor. I like this author's, you know, science fiction story. It doesn't have to come from Edge. It doesn't have to come from Daw. I like this author's work and be able to access, access it and read it and enjoy it. And so that's changed a lot. Um, it also <laughs> just who, and I think because of that, they don't always give us credit for that, but because of the independent author movement, you have more diversity in spec. You just oh, do. Absolutely. That's that's us. Like that's that's independent authors, that's hybrid authors who are pushing and saying, Hey, <laughs> we're here. We can't get past the gatekeepers, right? Because that's not really science fiction. And sometimes there's, of course, that myth that you can only have like one or two black people writing sci-fi at a time at that level. Right. Um, <laughs> right. And so that's right. So you, to get past that, those those roadblocks, those blinders, independent publishing and self-publishers, like writers who are self-publishing, are presenting fantastic work out there. Mm-hmm. And so that I think that's that's the biggest change I've seen in the industry. Now, now, when did you become a member of Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America? Last year. Well, I became an active member last year. I was a, where you don't have enough professional credits. I had 
it's not active. I was an associate member for years. Um, okay. But I finally had like, I think 2018, 2019, I had a series of professional level sales and I was able to like finally get my active member um, status with CIFWA. So that's, so last year, 2019, haven't been in it, for, I mean, we haven't been an active member very long. Um, but it's definitely, <clears throat> I want to be a part of it. Like, it, I think the day that I, it was like, they said, yeah, you're an active member, pay us money. I just cried because I was like, I haven't wanted to be a member of Science Fiction Writers of America forever, like 22 really? years. And now I'm a member and people are like, they can't do anything for you. I don't care. For me, it was a goal to be a member of CIFWA. Ray Bradbury was a member of CIFWA. And, you know, there's there's a legacy there that I wanted to be able to say I, too, was a part. It's like being part of a fraternity, right? Right, absolutely. <laughs> so, and, and so I really wanted that. And I my next goal is to get my Horror Writers of America thing. Um, Got to work on that. But, yeah, that was, so 2019. Now you have a bunch of accolades for a, a lot of your stories. <laughs> Which one stands out the most to you? Short stories? Yeah. So my favorite short story, the one that I can't read anymore, is Billy Speaker. It's a weird Western set in the New Mexico territory. And it's about a uh, a young black, a young black woman who is a ventriloquist, and her uh -huh. doll, which she calls Mama, is alive, but she only she knows it, and so it's um, it speaks for her, in many instances, Mama speaks for her, and it's about finding your voice, even when you're afraid, even when it's dangerous. And I wrote Belly Speaker during a very dark time in my personal life, which is why I can't read it anymore. Okay. But it it is a favorite. <laughs> it is creepy um, because Van, <laughs> Van Quillen's dolls are, they're just freaky, period, to me. Um, I'm about to say, yeah, <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> right. So that's, um, that's probably my favorite one, though I won't ever read it again. It is one of my favorite stories. Um, because it was very, it's very creepy, um, but it's a very good story. Mm. I have others, but you asking me to pick my favorite children. <laughs> <laughs> now take me on a journey of Nicole, the author, becoming Nicole, the publisher. So in 1998, I was, I just had my first novel accepted for publication, and I was very excited about that. Um, but I was very frustrated by the fact that I could not clear um, gatekeepers with my work. It was, I can't identify with that, or it, I just couldn't get anywhere. And so I started publishing an online magazine called uh, Mocha Memoirs Press uh, Short Story, no, Mocha Memoirs Short Fiction and Poetry Magazine. And so what we did was we published short fiction and poetry from a variety of people um, who just wanted to see their work out there on the internet. I mean, this is the early days of the internet, so everybody posting everything. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and I paid, I paid people for their work. Not much, $5 for a poem, $10 for a story. Um, and so I did that for about, from 98 to like 2002 when I started teaching. And then I just couldn't um, juggle both those activities anymore. And so I let it go. And then right around 2010, <clears throat> I just, I, again, frustrated with trying to get my novels to be picked up by um, traditional publishing. And again, the comment, the comments were often, I can't get into that, or I can't identify with that, or that's not something that I think would sell. Um, it was really frustrating for me, and I knew I couldn't be the only one. And so I said, I'm just going to open my eye. I knew at that point I had spent 
from 2003 to like 2009 writing under a pseudonym erotic contemporary romance and i wrote 80 titles wow yeah you'll never find them but <laughs> now you'll never find them. No. um <laughs> you will never find them now i took a break from science fiction actually and i was like i'm just going to write a romance story and i wrote a romance story and then i sent it out for publishing and so on and the publisher said hey we like this we'd like to publish it okay and they were like, we'd like to, well, a couple more of these. And I'm like, okay. So I wrote a few more. And then it got to be ridiculous. Um, it became 80. <laughs> it, yeah, it was a lot. Like, there, I wrote for, I was churning out, like, stories. And they weren't long. They were not, very few of them were novel length. They were mostly, like, 30, 40,000 words. But if you think about 30 or 40,000 words over the course of, like, oh, 80 absolutely. titles, it's ridiculous. So I can't write romance anymore now because I'm utterly burned out. Like I burned myself out, um, which is why when I decided to go back to this writing speculative fiction um, in 2010, I was like, I'm just going to, at this point, I knew enough cover artists. I knew enough um, editors because I had been in the small press publishing arena for like 10 years, 12 years already. Right. So I knew enough people to do this. Um, and so I did. So I'm just going to open my, I said, I've published other people before and I, I know what a contract looks like and I just did it. And again, the focus was, we were going to focus on underrepresented or marginalized voices and speculative fit, including women. And so uh, right. women who, there's a whole month in February called Women in Horror Month. That had to happen because men don't think women write far. And so this whole month is like they've been doing it for like 11 years now. This month of awareness of women in horror. Here are women horror writers. Um, and so we do a fair bit of horror. Um, and if you, we have Slay Stories of the Vampire Noir coming out next month, October 13th. And those are 28 stories of black vampires and slayers. Mm. We're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to get into that. <laughs> so, so Mocha Memoir Press, where'd you get the name from? Um, I, we, back in the early part of the new millennium, I started a short fiction and poetry um, magazine that that was and some of the stories that were told were, were memoir style um and so mocha be i didn't want like black woman press so i chose mocha memoirs um short fiction and poetry easing and so that's what we did we published for about probably five years short fiction and poetry from various and we paid like you know nominal fees five ten dollars um to publish you know short stories and and poems and so after that um, endeavor ended, a few years later, when I wanted to start the publishing company, I just went ahead and said, I'm going to keep that name because I already had like trademarked it. I already had branding for it. And so we just retained it as the press um, moving forward. So, but yeah, it has its origins in like the early days of the internet where, you know, there are a plethora of places to publish your short fiction work. Um, e-zines would crop up overnight, run for six months and then vanish <laughs> into the ether of cyberspace. So, yeah. Yeah. That's where the name comes from. So Mocha Memoirs Press. Mm -hmm. Tagline, Bold, Fearless Fiction. Break that down for me. So um, many of our stories are, and then what we, our mission, of course, is to amplify marginalized voices in speculative fiction. And that requires a sense of boldness um, to step forward and say, we're going to, these stories don't fit the mainstream mode or the popular mode or what has historically been defined as, as good science fiction, good fantasy or right or horror. Um, our stories, not that they're not good, but we don't fall into the gatekeepers um, kind of 
check boxes. So that requires a certain boldness and a certain fearlessness to present those stories in the face of um, that kind of viewpoint and mindset in the genres that we that we publish in. So that's why bold, fearless fiction. Mm. Now, one of the things I noticed about your company is you have a, a team, a team team. <laughs> so how did how did you link up with everybody? Obviously, I see AC. Obviously, shout out to Maya, um, who's on the podcast. You just have so many people. Mm -hmm. Adrian, um, how did you meet up with all these each of these people? And when so. Did you join uh, Ree Sheridan Rose and I go back to, she was my fiction editor way back when I was publishing the, the E! magazine. So I've known her for over 20 years. Oh, wow. um, and we met for the first time at, in, of all places at, at WorldCon in Ireland, in Dublin. That's the first time I really? met her. Like I had to leave the country, right? So we finally, <laughs> she lives in Texas, but it took us, oh, you know, <laughs> it took us like, but we didn't actually physically meet in person um, until we were in Ireland. But we have known each other and have worked together for over 20 years. Um, so when I was starting the press, I was like, I knew exactly who I wanted to be the editor in chief. I knew her work. I knew how she edited. I, I mean, we had, that was who I went to. Um, AC Thompson, aka Alexandra Christian, is a friend of mine and has been a writing friend of mine for about a decade now, I think. Same, and, and of course, Maya, I met at a convention. I remember I was talking about networking. Um, all of these, <laughs> all of these people who work um, at MOCA or who volunteer or who contracted to work at MOCA came about from conventions and networking. Um, mm -hmm. Novelette, I met through another writer friend who had a different publishing company for romance. Um, that's Jaya, uh, Jaya Lee and, um, Jeannie Johnson. They, they ran, they still run, uh, Beautiful Trouble Publishing. They publish, um, interracial ro contemporary romance. Um, and Novelette was one of their, uh, and it is still one of their editors and, and proofreaders. So I asked her if she would do work for me too. And she said, sure. Um, and so same thing. <laughs> Sumiko, Sumiko um, Salson, again, met her on the horror circuit. She um, is a big advocate for women in horror. She did like 50, 60 black women horror writers. She published that uh, book of just listing 60 black women who write horror because again the the myth is that a women don't write horror and b black women definitely don't write horror and Samiko was like no <laughs> here's 60 of them <laughs> and then she did a second volume here's 50 more um and so wow. she she writes she I was like yeah if you haven't seen those i think those are for free or for like 99 cents on amazon go check those out but uh Samiko, of course knows horror and so does my uh good friend eden royce so together just i, I need someone to proof a horror novel i need someone to edit a horror novel uh, come work will you mind doing this for us and so they sure i'll, I'll and so here they are and they get i do pay them they're not it's not volunteer. They do get money. I do pay them whatever their proofreading rates are for the work that they do. Um, I'm trying to think who else is on that list. I know Tanil was on that list. Tanil is someone I actually met at work, um, but she has a oh, master's wow. degree in creative writing. She's an MFA. And I was like, wow, I could actually use you. And she's like, sure. <laughs> and so, I mean, really, it's, it really is, I think out of all of them, Tanil is the only one I didn't meet, like in a science fiction networking, horror networking um, opportunities or venue. Um, but the rest of them, yeah, Maya Convention, AC Thompson Convention, uh, you know, just met people at conventions and, wow. work, and and enjoy their work. They enjoy my work. We talk. We're like, hey, do you edit? Can you? And, and, the F, and like, like AC Thompson, she like proofs my short stories. And I was like, you know, I have a whole novel here and it's a romance novel or it's a paranormal romance novel. Will you edit it and I'll pay you? Well, you know, and that's, that's kind of the way it works, right? And I watch and I monitor and if their editing is crappy, then I don't ask them to edit anymore, right? I ask them to do other things. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the way that works. Like that's how we all come together and we do, we talk and we meet and we think it, and we come up with ideas and we have, we share things. So it's very much a, it's my company, but it's, it's kind of our company. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that guy at the bottom, the only guy <laughs> <Wes>. <laughs> who picks things up and puts things down. That's my yes. 
So <laughs> as my husband, he does all the other things like he's yeah, he literally picks things up and puts things down and fix my website. <laughs> so <laughs> he's yeah, that's my husband. <laughs> so what was how important was it for you that to have a team to develop a team to put this work out? Because obviously you see so many people starting companies and they're just running everything by themselves. And like you said, they all of a sudden the company's just going, you know what I mean? So, but you're <laughs> here, you had the foundation. So how important was building a team when developing that foundation for your company? And, and know that the team members have come and gone, right? So we, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's just like any workplace. People come, they work right. for a little bit and they decide, Hey, I can actually do this better on my own or I can get paid more somewhere else. Or I've switched lanes. I'm no longer into, you know, proofing. I, I now I'm publishing my own stuff or what have you. Um, but for me, I can't do it all myself. Mm-hmm. And it took me a hot minute to understand that. I think the first probably six months that I was running the magazine, I realized I can't do this by myself. Um, and so that, that was, and I had at this point when the, when I started the press in 2010, I had already been like small press published for 12 years. So I'd seen, <laughs> I have horror <laughs> stories. I have stories for days um, about really terribly mismanaged uh, really? companies that were profitable. But because of their leadership, which just read it into the ground, like le- legal ground, <laughs> like oh, I don't want to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have made mistakes, too, but um, not legally. Hopefully, I'm pretty sure I try to keep all those things, all the boxes <laughs> right. checked. Um, but one of the things that I realized was. Trying to handle, trying to be to do, you have to delineate things. You cannot do it all. You cannot say, this is my company. I don't want anyone else to touch anything. <laughs> it's like plastic right. and furniture, right? They went out with the eighties. You have to be able to delineate, <laughs> right? You have to, and so, but you got to have people you trust to do that. Mm. And, and that's really, you have contracts in place. You know, you have to have, we're friends, but we still need to have a contract in place. We're right. friends, but we still both need to sign that saying that we agree that this is what we are, each of us are going to do. Right. Um, and so for me, it's really important because like I said, I can't do everything. And I edit, but that's not my strong suit. Even though I edited Slay, I still had it go through proof, several rounds of proofreading after I edited it. Um, the same way I would with any novel or right. any, right? So I think that's really key is to know what your strength and your weaknesses are. I am not a graphic designer. Maya Pressler is. And so mm-hmm. Maya does all the art. <laughs> like she doesn't do all the art, but she does all our promotional art. She does all the, she did the cover for Kill Three Birds. Um, so Maya does, she handles our social media, right? And the newsletter. Those are things she's good at. Those are things Nicole is not quite as good at. Could I get good at them? Good <laughs> practice, sure. Right. But in the, in the effort to not to put forth the professional, you know, look, I need someone who can do that. So, and and it, I don't know Sherlock Holmes as well as A.C. Thompson, a.k.a. Alexander Christian does. She knows it backwards, forwards, and around because she's a huge fan. Uh-huh. Not just of the TV shows or movies, but also of the actual stories um, by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. And so when she's, am I going to say no, lady? And at the Sherlock anthologies, um, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's your baby. Right. It's not my strong suit. And it's the same thing with Re. Like she's been editing for 30. She actually edit. she used to edit for another, a much larger um, press than us. And so she has decades of experience with editing. And so again, this is not my strong suit. I know what my, I know what my strengths are and these areas are not it. So you find the people who do those things well, are willing to work with you for the prices you're willing to pay. And, right, and right. that's what you get. And that's how you, that's how you, in my opinion, that's how you run a press. Mm. Now for, for all the writers and authors out there, how do they become a 
part of the team? How do they submit? Are, are you guys open for submissions right mm-hmm. now? So on our website, which is mochamemoirs.com, there's a tab, at the, there's a menu option at the top that says write for us. And if you click on that, it will give you all the, basically the types of stories we're looking for, the links uh, and all the submission guidelines. Now, what are what are what are some of the, I would say, requirements? What are you guys looking for, or what are you not looking for when it comes to submissions for your company? So we're probably full of horror right now. <laughs> we get a lot of that, <laughs> um, and, and if you're not careful, you, we'll look in and be like, "Wait, are they horror? No, well, are you, but you've had five horror releases in a row. I know. Um, what we're actually <laughs> looking for is we don't have enough fantasy. We, we definitely don't have enough epic fantasy. Uh, we don't have enough sword and soul type of fantasies. We were lo- definitely looking for those. We're definitely looking for stories from uh, the, our LGBTQ community members, our trans family. We would like to have stories that, and again, we do speculative fiction. Um, so in any other genre, science fiction, fantasy, or horror, or their subgenres, we're definitely looking for that. So those are, the, right now, we don't have enough fantasy, um, epic, um, we don't have we don't have a lot of urban like contemporary fantasy or urban fantasy. We don't have a lot of that. Um, we could use some more paranormal uh, romance fantasies, but we don't do erotica, and so and we don't do erotic uh, quite as much as we used to. So those are probably the two areas that we need the most in terms of like. So if you have a great sweeping sword and soul novel novel we're looking for those if you have a um a really lovely paranormal romance that's different than what is already out there um that market is super saturated but if you think you have a very unique uh perspective we'd love to see it mm. now speak speaking of writers you put together a lineup <laughs> of writers for um, your, your guys' next release, which is October 13th, mm-hmm. uh, next month. Yes, it's you coming out rather quickly, so we're very yes, excited. It is, right on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> it is called Slay Stories of the Vampire Noir. Now, it says Mocha Memoirs Press is proud to present Slay stories of the vampire noir a revolutionary anthology celebrating vampires of the african diaspora slay is a groundbreaking unique collection and will be a must-have for vampire lovers all over the world slay aims to be the first anthology of its kind few creatures in contemporary horror are as compelling as the vampire who manages to captivate us in a simultaneous state of fear and desire. Drawing from a variety of cultural and mythological backgrounds, Slay dares to imagine a world of horror and wonder where Black protagonists take center stage as vampires, as hunters, as heroes, and more. From immortal African deities to resistance fighters, matriarchal vampire broods to monster hunting fathers coming of age stories to end the life stories slay is a groundbreaking afrocentric vampire anthology celebrating the rich cultural heritage of the african diaspora Woo! first of all <laughs> i'm ready for it now <laughs> <laughs> We got to break all of this down. We got to break it all down. We got to break it all down. Because <laughs> the, the, the name, the cover is amazing. Oh, my gosh. And then the lineup. So let's start with the let's start with Slay. Break, let's break in the, the title. Right, so I did not have a title. Um, this idea of having a, vamp- a black vampire anthology has been kicking around in my brain for years. But it was actually... Um, Kai Leakes, who's actually one of the contributing authors, she would sometimes lament on Facebook about the loss of L.A. Banks and how she missed her and how there didn't really seem to be 
uh, not saying that there aren't black vampire stories being written. I mean, you can go to urban fantasy and on Amazon and see tons of them. Um, but what we were missing was LA Bates unique style of, of storytelling. And because she was kind of, she was one of the first women that I saw um, that actually centered a, a black urbanness around vampire stories. I, uh, and hunters it i missed her i missed her work um and so i was like man it'd be great if he just had a collection of stories about black vampires just to honor la banks's vision um and so that's kind of what i did but i didn't have a title so i was i had the cover already and i was talking to terry reed who is the cover artist and i was like terry i need a i need a title for this she's like well, why don't you just call it slay you know, and mm. it was a kind of a play on words because on the cover there's a there's a vampire hunter actively slaying someone, right? It's just like this car is slay. And so I was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. And the subtitle is I put the stories of the vampire noir, that's me. But the title itself did come from Teria um reads. And so it was perfect. I was like, yes. Um and then I started thinking about what kind of stories and who um I have like anchor authors who I wanted I definitely wanted them to be able to contribute. Uh Shuri Renee Thomas is amazing. Um I'm in awe of her. If you guys don't know her, she is the editor of Dark Matter, which is like the first collection of black science fiction. It was, uh, and I think she got like a world, she got like a world fantasy award for it. And she's like one of the first black people to get those. And it was just amazing stuff. Like she is just a force. She, she really is and a treasure. And so I would really wanted her her to contribute and she did and it is an amazing story oh my gosh so <laughs> <laughs> um but that's how the title came about the concept of slay like i said has been kicking around for a while i don't have a story um in slay because <clears throat> as i i may have as i may have mentioned earlier i don't want um my I didn't want it to, well, first of all, I just, I don't, if I'm publishing it, I don't submit my own story. I just don't want the editor of that anthology to have that dilemma. And this time, since I was the editor, I thought it would be um, just not in good taste. And actually, I don't have a vampire story to contribute. <laughs> so <laughs> I just didn't, uh, I don't, I like to read about vampires, but I don't actually write them. Really? Mm hmm I don't, I have never written a vampire story and only because I don't feel like I could contribute anything to the mythology of vampires. I have nothing new to add. And then I got like 75 stories. Um, here's what you can do with vampires, Nicole. Um, <laughs> right. And so, yeah, that was, it is an inspiring volume. And at last count, it was like 600 plus pages. So it's going to be a monster wow. book. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> it's, it might drop below that because, you know, those are like electronic pages. And once you actually bind it and put it in like a book, like a six by nine trade paperback, and right. we're doing a hardcover too. Um, the re so there's a hardcover and there's a trade paperback and then there's e the ebook versions. So it, It'll probably shrink down, but it's still going to be a pretty big book because there are like 28 <laughs> stories. Crazy. It is. Now, oh now, my now, now, how did you get all these authors to contribute to the? Well, not how did you get, how did you know which ones outside of your anchors? Because some of your other anchor, anchors are Jeff Carroll, Jessica Gage, mm -hmm. but the contributing authors, how did you decide? Um, which ones you wanted to add? They all came through slush, right? Because I had an open call um, for 11 spots. Of course, I grew, I ended, it, I took more than 11, obviously. <laughs> originally, it was only supposed to be 15 stories, and now it's 28. Mm. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, but what happened was I was reading stories, and um, I had a system and of course you read through them you go no 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 the ones that are easy no's you just go ahead and no thank you um and then there were some that were maybes and then there were some that were definites mm -hmm. and so i would read through the maybes uh again and then some of them would move to okay not quite right or okay that's similar to the definite i already picked or so i mean it basically it took me a long time 
um, to go through and just kind of use my system of gradually moving things from definitely no, maybe, yes, and then this, it's in. Because even some of my yeses upon repeat readings, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to have to put this one back. And, and there were really? some times that I, I would just cry and, and have to walk away from my computer because I can't pick, um, which is also how you ended up with 28 stories. Because there was some I'm just like, it's too good. I can't say no to it. I must have. And so it's going in. <laughs> Um, so yes, but it was definitely challenging and there are already conversations about, Hey, can we do this again? Can we have a second volume? Um, like we have to see how well the first volume does. Right. Oh, wow. That's crazy. (laughs) But authors are like, man, I really, I missed the deadline or I, I can, I can revise this story. I really want to be in a volume of vampire stories. Just vampires are beloved like beloved mm-hmm. creatures people love them um any which way you put them it doesn't even matter sparkly they love those not sparkly they love those. violent they love those it doesn't even matter <laughs> they love vampires and it in, in, in the more i mean think about how many times dracula has been remade like it's just and, and people would still sign up to see it again um right, even absolutely. though they know the story right um but yes love love but it was that's how i chose stories i read them and then rewrite some and rewrite some there were some that like stephen uh stephen van patten's the retiree i bawled the last two pages of it just really? cried like yes <laughs> but it's a mom but it's like a daughter daddy story so i'm a daddy's girl and so it just punched mm. me right in the gut that was going in like that one was like yep that's a definitive yes there were like alondria Hurt's story and uh, that that linger that stayed with me long after i had done reading it just it still lingered it kind of haunts me and so like craig uh l gidney's story oh i cannot wait for you guys to like get this Mm. book because that one blew, like, blew it up. And then my proofer, like, hit me up and was like, oh, my God, Craig's story. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's one of those things that you're like, you put out a call and you don't know what you're going to get. And then you get something brilliant. And you're like, wow, that is so not in the box. Right. That is freaking brilliant. Right. Um, and so there was just, like, so many stories like that. Um, Samantha Bryant's um, My Destroyer story, which is based on the 10 plagues of Egypt, the 10th plague, um, where, you know, the angel of death uh, goes through and kills all the um, newborn, Egyptian newborn mm-hmm. sons. Um, that's That story, like, again, I felt like I got punched in the chest. Woo! Mm. <laughs> like Rick Flair's, <laughs> right? Because that's kind of where you're at. And so they were just, uh, they were just like, uh, they're the um, Elmery Wood story, the dance. I felt like I was going to melt. That story was so hot. Like it was just, it's they're just good. I mean, they're just. I can't wait for you guys to get this anthology because I'm seriously like gushing. These stories are fantastic. <laughs> Wow. And I'm not, I mean, these are the ones that are at the top, like these are the ones that had, and there's like maybe three or four more that had like really strong gut punching reactions. And then there are other ones that are just flat out kick ass fun. Mm. Um, so you, yeah. And some that are very different um, perspectives. Um, so like Colin Cloud Dance's uh, Quadrilil is a very different approach. Loved it. Brilliant. Um, but it's not like any other vampire story you've read. <laughs> and Jeff Carroll's like the return of the OV is just so classic. It's so Jeff. Um, and it's just, it's, I cannot wait for people to be able to read these stories and enjoy these stories and to just see how these authors have centered black protagonists as vampires or as hunters or as slayers um, in, the, in the imaginative ways that they have. It is so freaking refreshing and 
not all the stories are, are emotional. Some of them are just, like I said, just fun stories. Here's a different approach to looking at, you know, a revenge vampire story. Um, but I did make the conscious choice like uh, to not include stories um, that deal with slavery. Right, right. Why was that? <clears throat> I felt like, um, number one, I feel like that story... That's for I feel like that's been told a lot, but I did, but moreover, I think we have more to more stories to provide than mm-hmm. that one. Mm-hmm. We are so much more than just we came over on the middle passage, right? Right. And so I wanted to show, I wanted to make room for more stories than just those than those because I feel like there's. You know, you can read Anne Rice's story about, you know, Queen of the Damned, right, or something, and and still get that story. I didn't, I didn't want that story in in my anthology. I wanted right. other stories where we are powerful, where we are great slayers, or we're horrible vampires. But we, <laughs> or and, and, and honestly, some of my stories are about family. Mm. You know. Um, so it's it's they run the stories run the gambit. So I, I hope everyone is on board for that. Um, for that, there'll be like <laughs> literally, I picked as many different stories um, as I could that were good, good quality. So it is a very diverse selection of vampire hunter stories. Wow. Do do you understand what you have? Right. <laughs> Just listening to you, I'm I'm trying to figure out have you put it all together and you understand you have like treasure with this release. You're going to open up I so many so. minds. <laughs> I hope so. You're going to, you're going to change the black protagonist when it comes to vampire stories. Now you're introducing so. this to the world. Um, mm-hmm. It's amazing. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. So amazing. Um, and definitely excited for, for the release. Um, what's going to be the breakdown of the Kindle release from the paperbacks, or are they all releasing on the 13th? They should all release on the 13th. Oh, okay. We're pushing for them all to release on the same day. <clears throat> and right. it, the thing about, um, the reason why if people go to the pre-order site in, on Amazon, they don't see the option for the paperback or the hardback, it's because Amazon doesn't do pre-order for uh, through KP through KDP for paperbacks. Right. And so I'm using Ingram. And so I need to have um, an Ingram. As soon as I get the cover and the final word count, page count, it'll show up under Amazon a few days later as pre-order for the, for the hardcover and for the paperback. But that will have to go through Ingram. And that takes a little bit. Mm-hmm. But there, now, will, there will be all three versions. So Nice. Now you we, we you brushed over the cover a little bit. You talked you talked about the title and all that, but but break mm-hmm. down the cover because you, you you mentioned it. You just you just threw it out there like yeah, somebody sl- is a vampire slanging on the cover. Oh no 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 no. Describe this vampire to to everyone's listening so they can understand. Someone said that. Doing. So it's a it's a <laughs> black woman with a ginormous <laughs> natural afro. Um. <laughs> With a like a samurai sword, like st- stabbing the the stomach of the uh, an undead that sprawled on the street, and she's dressed in contemporary clothing: black jacket, jeans, red red tank top underneath, big hoop earrings, um, and she's darker skinned. So, yeah. Explain why um, you chose to go with this character to represent the book? Oh, man. Um, well, someone said she looks like Pam Greer from the 70s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's an empowering figure, right? It's it's a, it's a no-nonsense kick-butt heroine that is not pale. <laughs> right. She looks like us. I mean, she looks like every, she. You would probably you could see her like at the beauty salon, or you could see her, you know, um, at the grocery store, or at your sister's basketball game. Like she is every black woman, mm. right? She's all of us. 
Mm-hmm. Taking care of business the way black women tend to do. Saving our butts. Mm-hmm. Again. <laughs> so, again. You know, it's like Dr. Karen and Blade, right? So it's, it's definitely a symbol of, for me, it's a symbol of Black women, again, defending against whatever known threat it is, and in this case, vampires. Um, but throughout the anthology, of course, there are vampires who are Black. Um, <clears throat> and so there's kind of a nice balance between how, which stories there are there Black vampires and which ones <laughs> have slayers. Right, um, it's right. not even, <laughs> but it is a very nice balance. Um, too. So I tried to make sure that we didn't have an overabundance of vampire stories. Um, I may not have been quite as successful on that front as I wanted. Because again, everybody loves vampires. People don't really love Van Helsing so or Slayers all that much. Um, it was some people do. But anyway, that's kind of I think one of my stories. I think Alicia McCullough's story is the last vampire huntress. Um, so that's also in there. And so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now tell everybody why it is important for them to get this book and read these stories. It's important um, for everyone to read these stories. It's important for people of color to read it because they get to see themselves as the protagonist, as the center. The story is built around them and they're not just window dressing um, in a scene, in a horror scene. It's important for non people of color to read it so that they get used to seeing people of color centered in stories Mm. to the point where it becomes not an anomaly, but hey, Bob's in this. It's normal. It's not shocking or jarring. And so it's important. That's why it's important for everyone um, to read diverse characters and to read diverse books, Um, not just for people of color to see that representation, which is oh so important. But it's also important for people who aren't black to read these stories so they get used to seeing black people in other positions and roles and stories that are centered on them that are speculative and not just what they get on TV. And what's next for Nicole after the release? <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of sleep. Because Slay is definitely <laughs> slaying my uh, ability to rest. <laughs> but for me as a writer, I'm like three chapters shy of finishing the next novella in my Kingdom of Avis uh, mystery series. It's a fantasy mystery series, so I'm. But they're novellas, so they're like forty thousand words. They're really short, um, and so I'm like three chapters away from finishing that. And I hope to have that one ready to go by like December, um, in terms of like being available for purchase and whatnot. But you can get the first one called Kill Three Birds um, now on Amazon and at MochaMemoirs.com. The second book is A Theft Most Foul, and yes, that's F O. W L ding. <laughs> um, so that will be out in December if all goes well. <laughs> now let everyone know where they can order Slay, where they can order all the Mocha memoirs, press books, and where they can order all of your books as well, and also all your social media platforms and how they can reach you. So you can order Mocha Memoirs books at mochamemoirspress.com. Um, many of them are available on Amazon. I think all of them are uh, and other platforms. You can find my work um, if you go to my website, which is nicolegivenskurtz.net. It has a list of all of my works. Um, but of course, I have an Amazon profile page. You can just search for my name and it'll bring up all of my works there as well. Um, I'm on Twitter at Nicole G. Kurtz and K-U-R-T-Z. I am on Facebook at Nicole G. Kurtz, K-U-R-T-Z. And uh, I don't, I do not have an Instagram, but I do have like a Pinterest board. So I don't remember what that is. So <laughs> I just take pictures of it. I don't remember what it's actually called. <laughs> Yeah, but most of my stuff, my blog, um, 
my titles, my newsletter. Do sign up for that. That goes out uh, once a month. Very fun. You get to walk through my gardening journey and see pictures of cats and food. Um, <laughs> that's it. You can sign up for that at NicoleGibbonsKurtz.net forward slash newsletter. Um, but yeah, those are all the places I am. All right. All Online. right. This has been the Fiction Addiction Podcast, and this was Nicole Givens Kirch. Nicole, thank you so much. We look forward to the story. Yes, thank you for having me. Such a great host. Thank you for joining us on the Fiction Addiction Podcast. Make sure you visit fictionaddictionpodcast.com for links on everything we talked about today, as well as awesome resources, additional tips, and fiction addiction merchandise.